Hello. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about conditional probabilities and uh, what role they have in Pavlovian conditioning. But before I talk about the role of conditional probabilities in Pavlovian conditioning, I want to talk about conditional probabilities in general. Conditional probabilities are really powerful ways of simplifying the world and making more accurate predictions about what's going to happen next. Now, we are we we make predictions about what's going to happen next all the time, and uh, we uh, it would be terribly uncomfortable to live in a world where you don't know what's going to happen next. It'd be terribly uncomfortable if you lived in a world if you opened a uh, you turned a, a doorknob and opened a door. Uh, you didn't, you couldn't predict whether the door was actually going to open. And if you did open the door, you couldn't predict whether it was uh, safe to step across uh, the doorway and that uh, you would encounter a firm surface that would hold you up. Imagine a world in which uh, you open a door and you step through it and all of a sudden <laughs> you fall 20, 20 feet uh, um, below the surface. Uh, that would be, that would be horrible. Uh, imagine a world in which you picked um, picked out food from the freezer and it was burning hot and you burned your hand. <laughs> or you got food off the stove and it was freezing cold. I mean, uh, we make predictions that the food we get off the stove is going to be warm and the food we get out of the freezer is going to be cold and et cetera. We make predictions like that all the time. And uh, those kinds of predictions allow life to proceed smoothly uh, without disruption or uh, and so on. So being able to make predictions is built into a lot of our behavior, how we interact with the environment, and being accurate about those is is very useful. <laughs> the more accurate you are, the more uh, uh, you can be prepared for what's happening next. Consider the weather. Is it going to rain today? What's the probability it's going to rain this afternoon? Well, if you calculate an absolute probability, that wouldn't be very useful because, you know, let's say the probability of rain on a given day might be 0.15. <laughs> well, maybe it's going to rain, maybe it's not. Uh, but consider what is the probability of rain if you take into account whether it's really cloudy and windy out. Well, if it's really cloudy and the clouds are so dense that they darken the sky, what is the probability of rain under those circumstances? Well, the number that you come up with is going to be a lot more useful and you can be much more accurate in predicting that whether rain is going to happen on a given day. In fact, the weather predictions have become so uh, accurate, they, they make predictions about rain is going to arrive at 3 o'clock instead of 5.30. <laughs> My negative words, they're always a little bit off. Uh, but it's remarkable that they're, uh, they're as accurate as they are. And they are as accurate as they are uh, because they extens make extensive use of conditional probabilities. They're not looking at the probability of rain, period. They're looking, looking at the probability of rain given this particular weather pattern, given how fast the weather pattern is moving and what the temperatures and, and wind and clouds are 200 miles away from uh, where I'm located. Those, given those conditions, it sets the probability of rain at my location. And under those circumstances, the probabilities are really accurate. So conditional probabilities are remarkably useful. And uh, they are used extensively in uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, one form of artificial intelligence uh, involves these uh, automated phone answering things where uh, uh, you call, call a number and before you can talk to a human being, often you can never find a human being, but the person you're going to be talking to is going to be a computer. And a computer is, has these voice recognition systems, which are artificial intelligence systems. They have to predict what you're talking about. <laughs> and uh, yesterday I made a call and uh, uh, before I could reach an operator, a human being to talk to, they wanted to know my account number, and it uh, and I was uh, uh, kind of struck by the fact that when they asked for my account number, they asked me to state the, the account number in terms of single digits, 
they didn't want me to say 25, 36, 4. Uh, they wanted me to say 2, 5, 3, 6, 4. Now, why do they want me to use individual digits instead of pairs or triplets of numbers, which is often the way I, I uh, think about phone numbers and account numbers and so on? Well, if you uh, just look at individual digits, then those, there are only six letters of the alphabet uh, that uh, start these individual digits, one, two, three, and so on. There are only six letters of the alphabet, which means that for the uh, computer program to detect which number you are saying, uh, the job is a lot easier for them, for the program, than if it had to consider the possibility that anything I said could start with any letter of the alphabet. That would make the job of the computer program a lot more difficult. So uh, the restriction to single digits sets a, a, a condition for what is the probability that I'm saying the number four or I'm saying the number seven and so forth. And it makes it easier for the program. And human beings are programmed the same way. Well, it turns out Pavlovian conditioning is built on conditional probabilities uh, so as to make it easier for us to uh, learn associations and navigate the environment and be more accurate about that. Okay, so <clears throat> the, uh, the slide we've got on the board uh, illustrates the conditional probabilities that are involved in Pavlovian conditioning. Now in Pavlovian conditioning, you basically have two critical events, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. And uh, <clears throat> what you're trying to predict is whether the unconditioned stimulus is gonna happen and you're trying to make that prediction based on whether or not the condition stimulus has occurred. So there are two conditioning, conditional probabilities uh, that uh, are involved in Pavlovian relations. One is the probability that the unconditioned stimulus will occur given that or conditional upon the fact that this CS has occurred. So this is probability of the U.S. given that the CS has happened. That's one of the conditional probabilities. And the other conditional probability is the probability that the unconditioned stimulus will happen given that the conditioned stimulus has not occurred. Um, P, open parentheses, U.S. given that no CS has happened. So you need both of those probabilities in order to use the condition stimulus as a basis for accurately predicting the unconditioned stimulus. Now the next slide is kind of complicated because it shows a contingency space. Okay, so what this contingency space is, is it involves the probability of the unconditioned stimulus given that the CS has happened. So that's shown on the bottom axis. And then on the side axis is the probability of the unconditioned stimulus given that the conditioned stimulus has not occurred. Now, when these two conditional probabilities are equal, <laughs> that's the 45 de degree line going from zero up to the uh, top right-hand corner of the box there. When those two conditional probabilities are equal, when the probability of the U.S. given that the CS has happened is equal to the probability of the U.S. given that the CS has not happened, under those circumstances, the condition stimulus is useless <laughs> in predicting the U.S., and that's called the zero contingency uh, line. Uh, under those circumstances, a contingency between the condition stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus is set to be zero. Uh, below that, we have a positive contingency space. In a positive contingency space, the probability uh, that the unconditioned stimulus will occur given that the CS has happened, that's going to be greater than the probability of the U.S. given that the CS has not happened. So any uh, conditional probabilities in the positive contingency space allow you to use the condition stimulus to predict the U.S. And a perfect positive contingency is the point at the extreme 
bright bottom of the axis uh, where the probability of the U.S. given that the CS has occurred is one and the probability of the U.S. given that the CS has not happened is zero. That's perfect positive contingency. The negative contingency space is uh, on the above the zero contingency line and uh, here the probability of the unconditioned stimulus given that the CS has occurred uh, is lower uh, than the probability of the CS given that no CS has occurred. And uh, uh, that results in what's called the negative CSUS contingency. And uh, under those circumstances, the condition stimulus actually allows you to predict that the US will not happen. Okay, and that leads to what's generally referred to as inhibitory conditioning. So negative contingencies generally produce inhibitory learning. Positive contingencies generally produce uh, excitatory conditioning. And both of these depend on conditional probabilities. And if this is a little bit more complicated, <laughs> then uh, you're comfortable with, uh, I apologize, uh, but um, these are un unfortunately uh, uh, detailed investigations of the relationship between conditioned and unconditioned stimuli often involves these kinds of complications. Hope you have a chance to uh, read about this and talk about it and do some exercises in class and get a better understanding of the role of positive and negative contingencies in Pavlovian conditioning. Thanks very much. I'll see you next time.